Nothing like a little good old-fashioned political pressure from the White House, exactly what President Obama played this week, as he signed an executive order that would prohibit federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. House Speaker John Boehner has been put on notice. That and much more from the electronic pages of Politico. Let's welcome in their White House editor, Dan Berman, joins us on Midpoint today. Dan, thanks so much for being with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. Fair to say that, the, uh, that John Boehner and the Republicans saw this coming, or was this just a complete surprise? Uh, they definitely saw this coming, and President Barack Obama has made it clear that he's you know, going to use the power that he has in terms of executive orders. You know, this one would allow um, uh, or would prohibit federal contractors from discriminating, discriminating against LGBT uh, employees. This uh, covers about 28 million people. And just like executive orders earlier this, this year on the minimum wage, it still only applies to uh, federal contractors and federal government. This means that, look, if you know, if they want to expand it to anywhere else and anywhere in the private sector, Congress will have to act. Obviously, the expectation Congress is going to do anything is slim to none. Well, that's the next point here, because there's a tremendous amount of hope here from some people that this does indeed put some political pressure on John Boehner and his group to do something. Do you think this does anything whatsoever and as far as pressure is concerned? I, I definitely don't think that John Boehner and the Republicans will feel any pressure from this. Again, you know, they, this is kind of thing they expected. And, you know, when you look at the Republican base, this simply isn't an issue that you know, rises up to the forefront for them. You know, it's not something their base is going to go to the polls uh, on or anything like that. Now, maybe in a lame duck session after the election, you know, when we've seen deals on, uh, you know, on this type of thing, um, you know, we saw with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, there was a deal after uh, the midterm elections a couple of years ago. But, you know, at the moment, and especially before November, we're not going to see anything. What is the take in Washington and the folks that you talk to regarding President Obama and executive orders and some of the unilateral actions that he has taken? As I talk to a number of my friends, every time I, I discuss this, they come up with legacy issues, legacy, legacy, making sure that's in. That's all I consistently hear. What's the take on the ground in D.C.? I think it's ex exactly the same. I mean, again, you know, we've seen, you know, look, the president and Congress don't have a good relationship. The Republican Congress has no incentive, you know, to start passing a lot of laws that, you know, fit President Barack Obama's agenda. Uh, Harry Reid in the Senate has been reluctant to move anything along. Obviously, you know, they're scared of, uh, you know, possible amendments. So, you know, again, I mean, this is what these are the options that Obama has. He can use executive actions. He can have the EPA uh, do something on climate change, um, on uh, you know power uh, plant emissions for you know that kind of thing. Um, so in terms of uh, his legacy, again, this is what he can do. These are issues that are important to him. You know, and he really talks about his legacy. He talks about you know the fact that you know he doesn't want to leave office without having done anything on. CO2 emissions, for instance. So absolutely, in terms of legacy, this is you know, one thing people are talking about, and they're right. Is there a feeling in Washington that come the midterms that what he is doing specifically, and let's look at this executive order as well, that it will help the Democrats in the midterms? It will be a, sub a substantive assistance to them come election time? Well, that's certainly the hope for Democrats. They, and as we see in all midterm elections, the key is to get out your base. And so, you know, some of the things that Obama has done, talking about, you know, this week's executive order, uh, the, you know, the EPA regulations on climate change, uh, you know, pushing on the minimum wage. These are, you know, uh, college loans. These are all designed to get the Democratic base excited. Um, you know, in the midterm elections, the president, the party of the president, generally always loses seats. And this is, you know, we see, especially with the Republicans hoping to gain the Senate. You know, the White House needs to try and do anything to stop that. This sort of thing helps with fundraising. It helps with getting the base excited. I'm not really sure it's going to be enough, you know, especially we consider midterm elections. They aren't national elections. You know, will this sort of thing be enough to get Mark Beggins reelected in Alaska, to get Mark Pryor reelected in Arkansas? So many of the Senate races are still local races. Mary Landrieu, you know, she's a household name and she's, you know, managed to win reelection time after time. Uh, you know, despite being attacked, she knows how to do this. Does she need Barack Obama to have an executive order on LGBT people? No. But, you know, in terms of helping fundraising, 
Obama went to the uh, DNC's LGBT uh, fundraiser yesterday. So that's what you know. some of these things are definitely aimed at. All right, you talked about fundraising a moment ago and also from the pages of Politico, an interesting story here about the Koch brothers because every time you bring up their name, it always <laughs> brings up uh, screaming on one side or both sides of the aisle, I guess. It talks about the Koch brothers, a significant new weapon in their expanding arsenal, a super PAC called Freedom Partners Action Fund, spending more than $15 million in the 2014 midterm campaigns. What's been the reaction around Washington with this uh, latest super PAC from the Kochs? Well, the cynical reaction is, all right, another $15 million <laughs> in you know, in an election where we're what's gonna fifteen million dollars among friends, right, Dan? Five hundred million dollars. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. Maybe not to myself, and maybe not to you, obviously. Um, but this is significant. And you know, when we talk about the Koch brothers and campaign finance circles, because as we know, the most of the spending from you know the Koch brothers and Koch affiliated groups, um, you know, and you know a lot of the people who've given to these groups have been in these uh, 501c4 nonprofits. That means a couple of things. One is you don't have to disclose the donors. And you know a lot of conservatives and a lot of liberals say, you know, look, once you disclose donors, you open people up to attacks, partisan attacks. And we've seen that, obviously, uh, in regards to the Koch brothers. So when you have a super PAC, though, you have to disclose your donors. So it'll be really interesting to see who gives to this super PAC and the other thing about a super PAC is you can be more explicit in terms of partisan politics. Now, so many of the Koch ads obviously are targeted against the Democrats, but they aren't explicit. They don't say, uh, you know, vote for X candidate. Super PACs can come out and say that. So I'd be curious to see what candidates uh, might get the explicit endorsement. Obviously, we know that when the Koch brothers and any uh, nonprofit groups goes into a race, you know, they're going in there with, you know, the idea of uh, helping one candidate over another. But again, they don't always say, hey, you've got to vote for this guy. Now they'll be able to do that. All right. I'm curious on something else here. Let's bring this around to what's happening today, because, of course, the Iraq situation is so fluid right now. We're hearing something almost every couple of minutes here. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of discussion about potential airstrikes. Now we're hearing that the president has decided that he may have to and likely will have to put off airstrikes because certainly the military is not ready for anything like this. What is the on the ground thinking there in Washington right now as to where the president may at least attempt to take this next? Well, the White House still insists, and you know, again, you can take this with a grain of salt, that the only option that has been taken off the ground is the idea of putting, uh, you know, putting significant uh, boots on the ground. Um, you know, we sent in the, uh, you know, 275 people a couple of days ago. You know, they insist that that's it. Like you said, the problem is airstrikes will take a while. Um, you know, there is some hope uh, seemingly, you know, here in the White House or you know, over at the White House and in Washington that maybe the threat of U.S. action is going to be enough to kind of slow things down. You know, if we say, all right, we're going to do airstrikes by a certain date. You know, that might just be enough to get everybody to, you know, to calm down for uh, ISIS or uh, ISIL, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, to, you know to, to stop their movements. You know, short of that, though, I mean, the options, we, you know, we can go after, um, you know, folks, um, you know, economically, for instance. Um, you know, there's some hope that, you know, our talks with Iran on uh, the nuclear issue might actually help help us there because, you know, look, Iran isn't happy with what's happening uh, with the, you know, with Iraq either. And so that gives us a potential ally in the region. The idea of the U.S. and Iran being allies on an issue is really kind of amazing. But that's where we are with this situation. It's definitely fluid. And the idea that there's one solution that the White House is attached to at the, at the moment, that definitely isn't there. They're trying to figure out what to do, what our goals are. Uh, what is achievable, what is achievable without getting us dragged into, you know, an armed conflict. Um, you know, Obama definitely doesn't want to start, you know, repeating, uh, you know, what happened in the last decade. You know, doesn't want to set us down the road for a full-scale war. I've got about 30 seconds left. I have to ask you, Hillary Clinton's book, Simon & Schuster, says <laughs> it might sell about 100,000 copies right now. What's the take in Washington on how her uh, pre-election or pre-election uh, run tour is doing? 
Um, you know, the, the take is kind of strange. I mean, you know, she had a couple of unforced errors at the beginning of it, um, and that's really unusual for Hillary Clinton. I mean, she's known for being relentlessly on message, um, you know, but then she started with, you know, saying, you know, look, you know, like Bill and I were poor when we left the White House. Um, you know, it seems to have recovered a bit. Um, you know, look, everybody knows it's a pre-election you know, kind of a pre-campaign test to see how it goes. You know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, she's been in New York and D.C., what the reaction is around the country. She's going, finally leaving D.C. You know, we'll see what the welcome is in places like Minneapolis and San Diego. Exactly. Politico will follow it, and so will we. Dan Berman, thank you so much for being with us. Dan, we'll do it again. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Hear what you have to say? Uh, we'll let you go ahead and get us on social media, Twitter, email. Facebook. Send it to us. We'll talk about it because you're on Midpoint. We question everything. 3 a.m. and you're up again.